This is Killer Innovations, a show about ideas, creativity, and how you can innovate. Welcome to the Innovator's Garage, where you learn to create your next game-changing killer innovation. Welcome to Killer Innovations, a show about how to use your natural creative ability to succeed at whatever you are passionate about. This week's show is different. Normally, I'm the one asking the questions of our guests. In this week's show, the roles are reversed, and I'm the one being interviewed. Now, I've been interviewed thousands of times in both print, radio, magazine, TV. I prefer radio or TV as it's harder for the reporter to get the story wrong. In all of my print interviews, and there's literally thousands of them, the reporters have gotten the story wrong 100% of the time. Now, recently, I was interviewed by Eric Vige of the Skeptical Executive Podcast. At the end, I felt the questions and discussions covered a number of areas and topics you would be interested in. So with Eric's permission, we are sharing that interview with you. So sit back and enjoy this special edition of Killer Innovations. Lots of companies claim innovation as a value. You know, we all know that many businesses were formed on the back of a single innovation 20 years ago. So there may have been innovation, there may have been innovative in the past, that one time, but now not so much. And that's partly because some businesses have just reached maturity, they've got a business model that works, they're making money, they've got a solid customer base, or maybe they're just in a business that doesn't really need innovation. I mean, you know, the guys who clean my carpets, for example, do they really need innovation? So some of them have got innovation as a value, and I've actually seen that on the back of carpet cleaning trucks, for example. But um, a well-meaning consultant type like me or you, Phil, comes to a CEO of a business and says, if you don't innovate, then your business is invariably going to decline. And that's the assertion. But I'm skeptical. So I'm an, you're an innovation guru. I'm obviously missing something. What, what is it? What am I missing? The, uh, the, the, what, well, actually, you're not missing anything, right? Because there's a variety of different kinds of innovations. I think innovation does get overused as a term or a word that is used. But in reality, innovation does have a role, even in that guy that cleans the carpet. Because innovation doesn't always equal that breakthrough, game-changing kind of innovation. They can innovate the way they you can schedule or reschedule your carpet cleaning, and that could be create an entirely different kind of customer experience. That does also qualify um, for innovation. Companies that don't you know, put their head in the sand and, and are not focused on innovation or don't even think about innovation within their business, whether it's the carpet cleaner or the, the local hamburger joint or uh, the leading companies in Silicon Valley, if you're not changing and adapting to the changing marketplace, look, your customers are changing, the markets are changing, your competition is changing. If you're not innovating, that means you're standing still. And if you're standing still, someone's going to go right past you. I've got a client uh, in an industrial area down here, the big in the mining industry. And I mean, mining is just taking stuff out the ground, right? Is th are there any industries that are immune to innovation? No, I, do, I believe innovation applies to any industry. You know, look, when I, when I got named CTO at Gila Packer, one of the first tasks they gave me was to uh, do a turnaround in the PC laptop business. At that time, HP was number four, number five in market share and losing you know, in the neighborhood of a billion and a half to two billion U.S. dollars a year. Loss. And, it, and in two years, we turned it around. We took the market share to number one and we were generating four billion dollars in profit in two years. And the, 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 the kind of the mindset was, was, you know, it's a laptop. How much innovation can you really stick in a laptop? You're buying a chip from Intel and software from Microsoft. And, you know, you're just like any other, you know, laptop manufacturer, you know, that goes to Taiwan or China to get your laptops manufactured. And we proved that wrong. We did create innovations. We, we did uh, looked at unique features. We went out and really learned what the customers were looking for. So we created a product that they loved and they actually became fans of. So something as commoditized as laptops had room for innovation. My belief is any industry um, has an opportunity 
to really look at the business different, look at your customers different, look at how you operate differently, and all are ripe areas for innovation. You've probably got some case studies, I and mean, you've just mentioned one. Uh, what are some of the hidden benefits to a business of being more innovative? I'm sure that the morale inside HP went up. You go from number four to number one. That's got to have a positive effect on people, you know, being happy to work there. Well, one, it had, it had positive impact on the on the, the people, right? Because when you're, you know, when you quote, you work, you're an engineer, you know, in, a, in, a, in Silicon Valley, and you're working, you feel like you're working for a company that's just being commoditized out. It's hard to get energized. Um, it also had a positive impact on the share price. Share price went from, you know, twenty seven dollars a share to over sixty dollars a share. So shareholders noticed it. Wall Street noticed it. <coughs> And it gave HP a huge amount of flexibility um, with those profits to reinvest into other new areas. And part of those monies was actually then used to uh, fund some of the other R&D and entirely different product lines, whether it be the 3D printing products, which now just recently came out from HP, or entirely new areas. You know, when you can bring innovations, and, and innovations in the way I think about it in the context of you know, my experience at HP is if you do really good innovation, meaning you're really focused in on satisfying the, the spoken needs and wants and even the unspoken needs and wants of your customers, they will reward you with a margin premium. And with that margin premium, it gives you more flexibility to continue to adapt the business, to be the leader in your marketplace. You, it's, it's that breathing room that just becomes so critical in these highly competitive times, those are fantastic hidden benefits that people might not um, might not realize when they start an innovation process. So, if I'm a CEO, if you know one of my listeners is a CEO, and somebody comes and says, "I want to be an innovation consultant," what some questions what questions should the CEO be asking to understand if this consultant is right? Well, you know. In- and you and I have talked about this on, on email back and forth with regards to a lot of innovation consultants that are out there. You know, one of the things I look for if, uh, if I was advising a CEO who wanted to bring in an innovation consultant is, is, you know, what is their experience, right? Have they actually been in the trenches? Have they had that frustration of trying to get an organization to change? You know, uh-huh. you know were they uh, leading innovation efforts in small, medium, or even, you know, large companies. You know, size of the company really doesn't matter. You'll find that, you know, innovation is just as hard in small companies as, as it is in large companies. It, it's hard work. And what you're really looking for is those people, you know, the consultants who have done that, lived it, been successful, but also have had some of the frustrations of, you know, changing organizations. Because it's not just as simple as to say, bring in a consultant and, you know, magically click your heels and, and, you know, all of a sudden now you're cranking out product because it's, it's transformative for an organization. You've got to think about your culture. You've got to think about your leadership. You've got to think about, um, you know, how are you going to empower the people in your organization to really take that next innovation step? And you want somebody who's got that experience. So the first thing out of the gate is, you know, have you done this? You know, have you led an innovation effort? There's, I've come across the, there's this kind of undercurrent of innovation consultants out there that haven't spent the time, you know, really honing that skill around being one highly personally creative and having led um, efforts that went from product or idea to something that actually turned into a product or a service. So that's question. That's really question number one. And question number two is, what is their philosophy on culture and the kinds of cultures that work with innovation? Because you want to find a consultant who's kind of on the same wavelength as the CEO and how the CEO thinks about culture. Because if you're asking a CEO who thinks one way about culture to completely go a completely different direction, that becomes just even much harder. And look, all of us have our own experiences with cultures that we like, cultures that work, cultures that embrace innovation. And you want to make sure that there's some middle ground between the CEO um, and the uh, you know, and the consultant. And then the third is, is, is this consultant coming in with a pre-canned kind of process or are they coming in and helping an organization adapt and adopt a, uh, processes and systems that work for the organization? There's some consultants out there that say, 
pick up my entire system and drop them in and, and adapt to my system. Or there's consultants that come in and say, no, we need to create and adapt one that fits into your culture, your language, the terminologies you use, your industry, and create something unique. I'm in the camp of believing that you can't pick up some consultants, magic 10-step process, and just you know use it. You have to adapt, and then you have to work with your organization to adopt it. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back to continue with my interview on the Skeptical Executive Podcast. Welcome back to Count Innovations. Here is more of my interview on the Skeptical Executive Podcast. What you taught me is business likes to have business as usual. That's the business of business is business. And the business of innovation is change. And you had a beautiful metaphor. You called it the corporate antibody. So what happens is some bright spark comes with a new idea and the corporate antibodies, you know, make that new idea go away. So the question I'm asking you is, if I'm the CEO, what question should I be asking the consultant around the culture that the culture fit. How do I know that that consultant's got the right culture fit with my organization? What kinds of questions should I be asking to explore that? Well, I would be asking the consultant questions like, so what are the, the key elements of a, of a culture that is, hasn't been, can embrace and uh, be successful, right? You know, if the, cult, if the consultant doesn't address things like the, end of the corporate antibodies or fear of failure or, um, um, uh, you know the the way authority is is handled within, or how decisions are made within an organization. Fear of failure, number one culture issue that we see in any company that's trying to adapt an innovation approach. <laughs> that fear of failure is is that you know you it's not a culture that embraces experimentation. It's not a, a culture that embraces trying things. And if they don't work out, hey, no foul. You know, well, what did we learn from this? How would we do this differently? Let's now go try a different way because that one obviously didn't work. In some cases, in some industries or in, in some companies, failure is, is marked by, you know, killing someone's career, potentially maybe having them removed from the company. That's not a culture that works. Um, the other is, is t getting an organization to change their culture. Let me tell you, it is incredibly hard incredibly hard i mean it'll be the, some of the hardest work you'll ever do even even tougher in many cases that than just getting a process into an organization and getting people to start you know, you know some form of idea management systems and how do you do the ranking of your ideas so you're working on the best ideas culture is much harder than any of that because you're asking people to change change how they operate how they interact with people how they um, think about themselves, the confidence they have in their position to put forward ideas that may be viewed as crazy or, you know, way out in the, in left field. So culture is, is one of those things that if you're bringing a consultant in and you're wanting to really get an organization to, to be ready to, to really embrace innovation and drive that, then it really, uh, that consultant really needs to have a lot of experience and in looking at existing cultures, identifying the changes to that culture, and then managing that change management. Yeah, I mean, just to be a little bit self-serving, I had, a, again, a, a supplier to the mining industry. We're big in the mining industry here in South Africa. And the, the MD said to me, please, will you help me um, with an innovation program? And I said, no. He said, what do you mean? I said, right now, this culture is a, a culture of fear. So what, and it's a very top-down culture. Now, you're the new MD. We're going to have to spend 18 months just trying to empower people, giving them a voice. Once we start giving them a voice and start letting them, rely, or letting them trust their own ideas, only then will we be able to start the ideation process. Only then will we be able to start an innovation process because until then, the managers are always just going to um, 
shut down any new ideas because the culture just doesn't allow for it. And to this guy's credit, he took two years and we worked with the culture and we started empowering people. And after a while, it was just, it was astonishing actually what happened. So what you're saying, Phil, I suppose, is that innovation is not necessarily about the innovation. Partly it's about innovation, but mostly it's about culture change. Exactly. And the culture change becomes the, the really the foundation. Without it, you know, you can go, you know, bring a consultant in and do a nice presentation, get everybody all worked up into a lather, run, facilitate some brainstorming, come up with a handful of ideas, but then it dies. Yeah. There, it, is not, it is not sustainable over the long term. And in fact, here where I'm CEO at this company um, here in the United States in Colorado, um, we took three years to take what was basically a, a, an accidental culture. There was no preconceived effort to try to define a culture here. We t- basically tore it down to the studs, rebuilt it from the ground up, and then also reskilled the organization before we even started, you know, really focusing on an innovation effort. Um, because again, without the culture in place, you don't have the foundation, and anything you try to build on a on a on a poor foundation will not be sustainable. No, no, I agree entirely. Um, going on to the next question, Phil, your top three habits that have made you a success in your field. What 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 should we be doing? Well, the question there is what field, right? As a, as as someone in the innovation space, you know what I what I focus on is I think about. Innovation, and more more specifically, personal creativity, is like a muscle, right? You're not going to get up off the couch on a Friday and go run run the uh, Boston Marathon on Monday. You've got to exercise that muscle. So for me, I have a daily personal habit where I spend 30 minutes in the morning working on and just ideating, just coming up with lists of ideas, I identify a problem space for the week. And I spend Monday through um, Friday, you know, spending my 30 minutes every day brainstorming on that particular problem. And then on Saturday, I go through the entire list and I do a ranking exercise. And a couple of things. One is I solve real problems. I run a couple of nonprofits. I have a a number of companies that I'm invested in that I'm not involved in on a day-to-day basis, but trying to help the CEOs of those companies. And it keeps my skill sets up to speed, right? Because... When you really need to be sitting down and coming up with a, those ideas because of some urgent need or crises, if you have not exercised your creative muscle, then your ability to be a top performing you know, creative athlete in responding to that sense of need right at that moment, your muscle's not ready. So for me, it's that daily exercise. So Monday through Friday, 30 minutes of brainstorming, Saturday morning, go through and rank those ideas, which are the best ideas. Then I prepare those and send those to whichever teams working in the problem space that I was thinking of. And I take Sundays off. So that's kind of the, the critical, you know, skill sets and, and things that I do to keep myself sharp. 30 minutes a day. And that's just yourself and a notepad and a, and a pencil. Yes. 30 minutes a day, just with my moleskin notebook and I actually have a very specific version of the moleskin I use that has a very kind of unique layout to it that allows me to capture and rank the ideas. We'll be right back after this break. You're listening to Killer Innovations on the BizTalk Radio Network. Welcome back to Kill Innovations. Here is more of my interview on the Skeptical Executive Podcast. I spend the first few minutes before I start the brainstorming with some form of inspiration. So I'll try different types of music, music with lyrics, music's not, acoustics. Right now I'm, I'm finding I've got a playlist on Spotify that's... Um, uh, uh, acoustics, uh, instruments only, no, no, no lyrics. I find lyrics are, are distracting for me. And I'll actually tr- test it. So I'll use the same inspiration for five days. How many ideas did I generate? How many really good ideas came out of that? And then the next week I'll try a different inspiration. I might do 
um, brain teasing puzzles. I'll do 10 minutes on a crossword or Sudoku or some other things to get my brain kind of going. And then I'll do my brainstorming every day. And I'm testing out what is um, the inspiration that works for me and, uh, and then measure myself on um, hitting my idea quota. So I believe in setting an idea quota for every time you're sitting down, whether you're running a group brainstorming or you're brainstorming individually. Because an idea quota, and I force myself to hit the quota, it gets you out of the habit of just stopping when it gets tough. And that you break through kind of the barriers of, you know, you come up with like eight ideas and then you, your, your mind goes blank and you can't think of them anymore. If you've got a 25, um, a quota idea of 25, then you just, you got to work it through. You force yourself, which actually helps you break through the barriers that typically cause most people um, that are trying to do any kind of idea, idea generation um, to cause you to stop. Oh, I got to eight. Uh, some of these are okay, but boy, I, I just went, my mind went blank and I'm going to stop. You know, yeah. you don't, you don't stop. Innovation's hard work. You got to, you got to, you got to put yourself through it. And is 25 uh, ideas for a 30 minute session. Is that, is that a good quota? It's a, yeah, it's a, it's a good quota, but you got to keep in mind, it's one of those things like running, you know, if you've never run before and you're getting up off the couch, you probably walk to the mailbox and back, you know, in the first week. And then the second week, you walk around the block. And then the third week, you may do a slow jog around the block. You work yourself up to it. Uh, and the idea quota is not so much of a, you know, the, the end result. The end result is you want to generate great ideas. So how do you do that? You need inspirations, you know, things that get your brain kind of going. Um, I read a lot. So, I'm, you know, I've got you know, I get these random connections in my head of, wow, if I took that from that industry and this from this industry and put them together, wow, I can come up with, you know, something pretty interesting. And, uh, but uh, 25 is usually, a, you know, it, it should be a pretty good target. You know, first out of the gate, you might be doing, you know, 10 or, or you know, get to a dozen, then you might get to 15 or 16, and then you build yourself up to 25. But 25 in a 30 minute, once you get into the groove, um, should be one that you should be able to uh, click along at uh, pretty easily. I've, I, I've, I could, I'm, today I'm probably, I can do, you know, 35 or 40 in a, in a 30 minute session. But, you know, that's also years and years and years of, you know, exercising the muscle, you know, doing these exercises every day, you know, but if you want to be, if you want to, if you want to be able to have that muscle to call on as needed, you need to exercise it. No, no, that makes sense. The other thing I always admire about you is your your trend safaris. How do you go about spotting trends? <laughs> yeah, the trend safaris. <clears throat> so a couple times a year, I'll uh, I'll take some trips. You know, one of them I take every year is I go to the main TED event. So I just in fact just came back. I just came back from uh, Vancouver, which is where now TED is held every year. And as uh, Chris Anderson, who runs TED, says, it's 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 the one week brain spa. Um, so you can uh, sit back and uh, hear interesting speakers and cause you to think. But my trend safari is really I go into uh, entirely different kinds of, uh, you know, uh, industries and areas. Like so when I was at HP and we were heavily into trying to design really top notch consumer products, um, what we um, what we would do is we go like to the Hanover Furniture Fair. So you go to Hanover, Germany, and you're looking at where furniture design is going, which kind of tells you, gives you a hint of what the living room is going to look like, you know, five years from now, what are the new colors, those kinds of things. Uh, but for me, the trend safari is going into analogous or completely different industries and seeing what they're doing. So I'll take a group of people with me. I'll take, you know, some of my staff. I'll take people from other companies, other uh, innovation leaders, and we'll go, you know, you know, and we'll do these trips, and I tend to do them, you know, over and over again from the standpoint of we, once we get on the road, we'll do two days at the Hanover Furniture Fair. We'll go to Paris, to the Louvre, look at, you know, look for inspiration in the form of art and architecture. Um, you know, we'll go to Detroit in the automotive industry and get inspiration from the design teams and the in the in the uh, technologists in automotive. We'll go to Silicon Valley. We'll go to Tokyo. And it's really about looking for what's that thing that, that's not now, but it, it's going to be coming in three to five years, and what inspiration that gives you. Because the auto manufacturer works on kind of a, a five-year 
forward view. If you look at the models now, those will be cars in five years. Furniture, it's like three years out. Uh, consumer electronics is, it tends to be much shorter. You're in uh, 18 months to two years out. But you're looking for kind of trying to find those things that other industries are, are looking to bring in and see if it gives you any kind of insight into the market and customers that you're looking to serve. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And then you obviously do a, a debrief every day just to um, reflect on what you've learned. Yeah, we do that. We also are big on taking pictures and videos and doing interviews. Um, and then I share those on my on my podcast and my radio show to my listeners to try to give them a little bit of insight of some weak signals, you know, that are coming in. And we look for these weak signals, which are really the things that tell you that hey, something's gonna about to happen. But it's pretty weak. You gotta really have your eyes and ears open. And what I found is you just can't be sitting behind your desk and just think you're gonna you're gonna come up with these. You gotta go interact with people. You gotta interact with people who are looking in this in the spaces that they're experts in and and connect those dots. That's really where as an innovator you can deliver a lot of value to your clients or to the organizations you're part of. So what weak signals did you pick up at your brain spa, the TED conference this year? Um I mean, one was, you know, you know, there's you know, there obviously a lot of really great uh, speakers. You know, Ray Kurzweil, who's the chief futurist for Google, um, was there. And, and Ray was talking a lot about, you know, the, um, the future of human-computer interaction. It's been, you know, we've been talking about some in science fiction books for millennia. Um, but, you know, Ray was, you know, really getting into – you know, what he thinks are the near-term, mid-term, and, and long-term. Uh, Jaron Lanier, he's the basically the father of virtual reality. Um, he did a talk. His talk's actually already up on TED. I think this morning I checked it. It was 480,000 views. Um, wow. And he was talking about AI and really um, the issue of AI. Plus, he had kind of an interesting view of um, the role of privacy, and it's a top topic now with what's going on at um, Facebook and Google and others with consumer, you know, kind of consumers pushing back on the um, the privacy issues that uh, people are giving up control of all this data, and then this data turns around and gets used against them. So Jaron's talk was was really interesting, and then really the one Steve Pinker, um, he's the author of a book called Enlightenment Now. Um, he's a professor at Harvard, and Steve's. He actually did two talks um, last week, which is extremely rare, an 18-minute talk, and then they did another 90-minute session. But his book looks at the statistics that everybody quotes to kind of create this alarmist attitude that you know the world's coming to an end and society's in trouble. And in an 18-minute talk, he did 52 slides to prove that all the statistics that everybody's using is all bogus, you know. <laughs> And let me tell you, in a crowd like TED, that got a lot of attention and generated a lot of conversation. What are the real issues? You know, do you just ignore it now? Oh, it's, everything's fine. You don't have to worry about things like global warming or, you know, death rates from handguns and all these other. You know, Steve showed all these slides and says, "Look, you know, I think he, his one that I like was, you know, even the acts of God, you're like something like 37 times less likely to get struck by lightning today than you were in 1950." You know, and he showed all these statistics. It was pretty enlightening. I think it was kind of a forced you to look at the problems and, and the things that people are focused on differently. And that's what I look for. I look for really smart people who have really interesting questions. I'm really focused on the questions people ask and questions that would cause me to look at the problem differently. That's the key because we all tend to look at the problem the exact same way we've always looked at it. With our based on our experience and education and those kinds of things, you need something that jars you to look at a problem or look at an opportunity with with fresh eyes, with a completely different perspective than you've been looking at that same space um, for years. We'll be right back after this short commercial break. Welcome back to the show. Let's continue with my interview with the Skeptical Executive Podcast. Uh, 
Um, Phil, what is a one question that people ask that uh, yeah that you find yourself answering over and over again around innovation? Well, I think the one question I get a lot is people just don't think of themselves as being innovative. You know, it's the I could never be innovative or it's not me or can anybody really be innovative? And my answer to that question is, is everybody is highly creative. Everybody. We're born as creative beings. You know, I now have five grandkids. I had three kids, five grandkids now. And I look at my grandkids, right? You know, Liam, he's my, he's my five-year-old grandson. That kid can take anything, toilet paper roll, empty paper towel roll, and he will create his own storyline, his own game. You know, he was trying to teach me a game the other night, and he was telling Papa, you, you're not following the rules. And I'm like, in my head, I'm going, I don't know what the rules are because this is a game in his head. Um, but, you know, highly, highly creative. And, and I've done this test. You know, you go into a kindergarten class and you ask, you know, a bunch of five-year-olds, you know, sing me a new song, show me some of your artwork, you know, show me a dance that you create or whatever. Every kid in the classroom wants to do it. Now you ask that same question every grade up until just before they go away to university or college, and you go from an entire class to maybe one kid in the entire school. Right, who and it's usually the weird kid that nobody wants to eat lunch with, um, <laughs> you know. Yeah, but we it's basically, an isn't it? it is because you know in education we're tend to we're taught conformity. You want to look the same, you want to act the same. You know, if you're a little bit different, you do not want to stand out because that puts you in being a target to be bullied, and you definitely don't want to be doing that. And then nowadays, if you you know, there's been a lot of surveys of CEOs. The number one skill set that CEOs want to recruit for now is those that are highly creative, innovative, people who can help bring new ideas, you know, into a, in a, into a business or an industry. So you're taught to conform, and then all of a sudden now you get into the work world, and now you, you need to come up with different ideas. You need to act differently. You need to think differently. You need to think highly creatively. And how do we, <clears throat> how do we expect our kids to make that transition from being taught conformity to now all of a sudden being taught to be highly creative? And that's why I think, and I, I'm been talking about this for decades now around we need to rethink the education model and how do we prepare the, our children to be the workers of the future when it's no longer an information economy because look you know google's pretty good if i need to learn a fact or look up a formula i don't go back to my differential equations course at university i go i go to google and find a youtube video or a khan academy video remind myself how that formula works, and then I can apply it to whatever I'm doing. So the information economy is basically replacing the need for me to memorize where the economy is going is we're going to an innovation economy. And the innovation economy says that the value of a worker in that workforce is not about what they do with their hands, but it's their ability to generate ideas for the business. So if you want to be highly valued and be rewardly, you know, be compensated appropriately, and is, is that you've got to embrace this innovation economy or you're going to be that laborer when it was the industrial economy or you're going to be left behind as we shift from this in, information economy to the innovation economy. Where can we find you? What would you like to talk about? I mean, what are you working on at the moment that we can engage uh, with you? Well, I, the best way to, is to keep up with what I'm doing is listen to you know the podcast. It's Killer Innovations. We're now in season 14, as we just clicked over 14 years on our podcast. A lot of people are going, I didn't know podcasting was around for 14 years. Yeah, I was podcasting before iTunes. <laughs> um, so they can check that out. It's a nationally syndicated radio show. We're covered on 35 stations here in, uh, in the United States. Um, I personally blog and write over at filmkinney.com. That's been my blog, been up since 1996. Um, so I've been doing that. And then if people are keenly interested in understanding, you know, innovation and creativity, they can buy the, my book, which is Beyond the Obvious. It's available and, you know, online. You can buy it from all the online stores. It's also available um, as an ebook, uh, both on Apple and on Google. And you can also get the audio book. It's available on Audible um, also. But that's the best way. And you can follow me on the social media. You can just search for Phil McKinney. All one word, no spaces, and you'll find me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, etc.
That's fantastic. And your Killer Innovations uh, deck? Yeah, we actually, we yeah, you good reminding. We just, the uh, Killer Questions uh, card deck. So in the book, I'm a big believer of questions, asking questions. So I've got a collection of, now it's up to a couple hundred questions um, that I use in my own brainstorming or when I facilitate um, for other companies. We've taken the 40 that I actually talk about in the book and we put them into a card deck. So you can use it individually if you want to do um, your morning exercise, or if you want to use it in, in a brainstorming session with your teams. Um, it's 40 questions, very generic, not tied to any specific industry, can be applied to literally anything. And uh, that's now available uh, both up on Amazon, but it's also available over in, um, in at, at innovation.tools. So innovation.tools is an online store specifically for innovators. So you can buy, you can get the book there, you can get the, the card deck there, et cetera. That's fantastic. Um, anything, any last words, Phil? No, I think this has been great. It's always nice to uh, talk with other uh, people who are in the innovation space. And uh, this, has been, uh, this has been a lot of fun. I appreciate you uh, giving me the time. I appreciate you. I appreciate all the work you've done for the last 14 years. As I said, I think I was listening to your very first your very first uh, uh, episodes. No, really, I was. And uh, so your voice is very familiar to me. It's, uh, um, and I just want to say thank you so much. You know, in the early days, you used to sometimes say, the reason I'm doing this podcast is because I'm paying it forward. You used to say you had mentors in your early career who helped you for no thought of rewards, just because they wanted to pay it forward. And this is your way of doing that. And I, for one, have been a beneficiary in my clients have been a beneficiary of that and i just want to acknowledge the 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 generosity that you've displayed and thank you very much on behalf of me my clients and i'm sure anybody who, who's ever listened to you so thank you so much for all your for all your energy phil well thank you very much it's it's been a blast and i've got to meet um a community of uh, great people such as yourselves out there you know doing doing the work every day trying to help businesses be successful Thanks for listening to this week's show. Let me know what you thought of the special edition. Drop me a note over at phil at killerinnovations.com. We'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye.